you and I rely on the ability to communicate every day, right? We do it to understand the world around us and to understand how we operate. Today, I want you to start by thinking about those people around you with you communicate with, right? Your parents, your spouse, your friends, right? Maybe the police or a physician. And I want you to think about the type of information you communicate with them. Today, I'd like to present someone to you with whom I communicate, who explores around, around himself and lets me know about what he's experiencing. But unlike what you might be imagining, right, this special someone is Goodwin. Now, Goodwin is not hiding behind the bushes. Goodwin is the building, a five-story, 160,000-square-foot building, right? But Goodwin is a little bit special. Goodwin has the ability to sense, and, the, and he's starting to communicate with us to tell us things about himself. As a matter of fact, he senses things every day. He, th he senses crowds of people coming into work. He senses crowds of people going out to lunch. He senses that some of them come back from lunch, right? <clears throat> he feels the weather. He feels the rain. He feels the wind, right? So this is a little bit different from what you might expect from a building. So to get us started, I'd like to show you an example. On September 7th, 2016, just a few weeks ago, Pawnee, Oklahoma experienced a 5.8 earthquake. The earthquake, right, and its ripples spread across the country like ripples in a pond. But when it came to Tennessee and Virginia, we didn't feel it anymore. But unlike you and I, Goodwin actually felt it. These are the sensors in, in Goodwin showing you that about 8, 10 a.m. on that Saturday morning, right, the building started to move. So we could say that 909 miles away, 187 seconds later, Pawnee met Goodwin, and Goodwin was all shook up, <laughs> right? So what you see here, right, is an animation of what the sensors were feeling through that moment, through that earthquake. And although it wasn't that bad as the picture shows, right, it's, it's been exaggerated for visual purposes so we can understand the motion in the building, it lets you know that Goodwin can actually start to communicate with us of what he's feeling and what he's going through, right? So with that in mind, I'd like to ask you a question, right? What has your building done for you lately? Right, I know that's kind of weird, right? But what has your building done for you lately? Has it been able to adapt, right, in order to save you energy? Has it tracked your health? Um, has it kept you safe? Has it helped your grandmother and your grandfather not fall? And you might, these thing, you might be thinking, these are, these are not normal questions. Um, but that's why we're here. Right, so with that, I'd like to take you on my journey. What started out as a spark, a small idea, and has led us today to one of the most instrumented buildings in the world for vibration. This is, this is changing for us how we think about a building, how we interact with the building, right? And what we can start to do in the near future. Hopefully today I can challenge your preconceived notion of a building as this inanimate object that doesn't do anything for you, right? And together I can show you how we, which is the important word in this sentence, are changing how this is done and how it takes a multidisciplinary group to take this and do it. So let's back up a little bit and start from the beginning. So how did we get started? In the fall of 2011, I was hired at Virginia Tech in the mechanical engineering department, and I had just come from England from putting hundreds of accelerometers on helicopters. And I sat across my office, and this was the view from my office. It was Goodwin Hall being built, back then called the Signature Engineering Building. And I decided that it would be a good idea to place these sensors throughout the building at a very large scale. What's funny about ideas is actually how they flourish and that they need to be nourished. So the honest thing was that I went to a soccer game, I ran into one of the associate deans of the College of Engineering, and we found out that together we had this idea that we wanted to make Goodwin a very special building. So then the next thing I did was what any professor does, grabs his best assets, right, his students. And they're always willing to do all kinds of crazy things with us. And we went out and started to collect pilot data, putting sensors, measuring, seeing if we can get anything out of the building that would make any sense. We started to share that idea with other faculty members who very quickly bought into the idea and had the ideas of their own of what we could do with this data, right? Three long and hardworking years later, we had, we had instrumented Goodwin Hall to be the most 
the most instrumented building in the world for vibrations with 213 sensors throughout the entire structure, 65,000 feet of cable connecting every sensor to every computer that collects data. And it just so happens when you buy 65,000 feet of cable, you can get it in any color you want, and hooky orange is one of them. <laughs> um, so that was great. So the next thing we did was we pulled the switch and the data started to come in. And the question was then, what do we do with this data? So much like Frankenstein's monster, right? By putting all these sensors throughout the building, we had just given the building a heartbeat. And now we were monitoring this heartbeat by 213 of these examples. Today we've learned that what you're seeing right there are a series of multiple events. A door is opening and closing, a person is walking across a hallway where there's a sensor, and a piece of equipment machinery is turning on, right? So then we set out to say, okay, what can we find out and what can we do, and how can we use this to better our society? So you clearly saw the first example, which was the earthquake, which actually shook the building. But buildings move in very peculiar motions, structures in themselves. Uh, with this, we are learning that the models we make can be better, can be better tailored. We can make more efficient buildings, we can make safer buildings, and this level of understanding is changing the way we can understand buildings. But like any good doctor, we wanted to go deeper inside. What you see here is the motion of the individual sensors letting us know what's going on, right? Where yellow is, is a sensor that is not seeing a lot of activity, and red is a sensor that's seeing a lot of activity. You can see that as the day goes by, more and more the sensors turn red, which correlate really well with actually class exchanges, lunch times, and so on. And this and now it starts to be an idea of what you can do with this information, right? We can understand how to control HVAC better, we can control lighting better, we can save a lot of energy when it comes to a building. But we could also help people during an emergency evacuation. So when we saw this information, we wanted to go even in deeper. So what is causing the sensors to actually uh, respond this way? Well, it turns out that very small vibrations in the building, which could be caused by the heel strike of your walking, right? span through the floor like ripples, like the earthquake, and our sensors start to pick them up. And what you see there is a simulation of these vibrations throughout the building, right? And much like you're finding me on stage, you're using both of your ears to triangulate where I am, we can use that information the same way to find and locate people in the building. We can do it today under very controlled experiments, and we can find a person in a 160,000 square foot building within a one foot radius, right? So, okay. So we said, okay, we're starting to understand how the building reacts, but can we start to understand what is causing the incidents to occur? And the next thing we did is we wanted to study people. What you see here is in red, a woman walking across the hallway with high heels, and in blue, a male walking across the hallway with soft shoes. And you and I can clearly tell the difference between those two, but what we're trying to do today is get computers to do this for us, to develop mathematical models that are capable of distinguishing this. But we didn't want to do it this easy. So what we obviously did to the computers is we gave them a little bit more of a challenge. We mixed the shoes up, we had everybody wear hard sole shoes and soft sole shoes, and as of today, we can distinguish gender with a 97% accuracy, right? And you might be starting to freak out, and okay, that's fine. <laughs> we don't like to do things safe all the time, but you can imagine that if we're searching for someone and we can divide the classification by 50%, our ability to find someone reduces, right? And we can save people much quicker if we're looking for some. Right? Some other people are interested in things like customized marketing in the mall, so that as you walk, we can feed you exactly what you want, we want you to buy. Right? That's up to them. Anyway, so of course, this leads to a lot of questions of privacy, and just like today you left your fingerprints here in, in this wonderful auditorium, you're not worried because I don't have a database to pull you out and compare that fingerprint to that base. So you can see how this technology can actually be scaled for privacy and won't necessarily be an issue. But with that in mind, you know, weird experiments have not always been received well, and this is not the first time. Actually, a very famous doctor, Frankenstein, in the film of 1931, his advice was said to him, right? You have created a monster and he will destroy you. And I would hope that we would react a little bit better and move towards Frankenstein's answer. And he says, patience, patience, I believe in this monster, as you call it, right? And if you don't, well, leave. <laughs> right? So far, he's been kept in complete darkness. 
wait till I bring him into the light. So hopefully today, right now, with the next few examples, I'll show you some light. Let's start with some interesting statistics. 56% of older adults who fall die within six months. Results in 2.3 million visits to the hospital, 20,000 deaths a year, right? And $30 billion in cost. What if the building could actually let us know that it's happened automatically and deploy emergency to that situation? This research in particular is quite hard to do because for some reason it's not okay to invite people to the building and trip them. Um, so simulating this data requires a little bit of finesse, which we haven't gotten there yet, but my students are developing some fun ways of trying to figure this out. Sometimes they need a little push. Um, anyway, but what I want you to get out of this is that what the building sees when an event like this happens and the previous ones we've talked about, a few things are very different. So right, the top one is a simulation of a dummy falling, right? The bottom one is the door closing. So if we can develop mathematical models that are able to pull this apart at all time, run 24 seven, right? There's a lot of information to process and you can see how this is not just the work of a mechanical engineer, right? Computer science and mathematics and so on. So it's a very, very tough problem. So with that, I'd like you to imagine the future with me of say we could concurrently do this all at the same time. This is a floor plan of the fourth floor of Goodwin Hall. So for example, let's imagine that the building detects the situation, right? At that moment, it moves forward. It says, I've located this, this event. I'm classifying it. I'm trying to figure out what it is. So I'm deploying countermeasures, right? At that point, it might tell you on your phone or on your watch what's going on, right? It might then decide to call the police and say, hey, we have an intruder in Goodwin Hall, right? He's in the third floor. He's moving. He's male. He weighs 190 pounds, right? Uh, he's discharged a nine millimeter weapon and I'm currently tracking him, right? The police could then respond and say, we're on our way. Please help these people out. You say, okay, I've locked the third floor. I'm evacuating one, two, and four, right? The building uh, can then respond to the police. The police arrives. The building deploys that information to the portable devices. It tells them what is the fastest route to enter the building, right? It tracks them coming into the building and then it gives them second by second information about their approach, right? The building could be the first responder. And in a lot of situations, that's all the time we have, right? So today, hopefully, you've been a little bit challenged about your preconceived notion of what a building might do in the future, right? How a small idea, when it's nourished, right, can flourish into something quite unique. How it takes a multidisciplinary team to get these ideas carried out today. So for me, that's why I think it takes a smart village. Thank you.